speaker today, we have a really uh, knowledgeable experience and great speaker today, and we are so happy about it. We have Mr. Hadi al Hatab, a uh, senior bridge engineers at Jacobs that will be joining and uh, joining us soon. So Mr. Hadi is a bridge project engineer in the New York office of Jacobs with more than 10 years of experience. His experience includes the design and rehabilitation of superstructure and substructures components for different types of highway and railway bridges. That includes analysis, design, road rating, and specification development. His skill set and experience also include extensive expertise in the design of high speed rail bridges, light rail transit bridges, and highway bridges. And uh, right now, Mr. Hadi is uh, already joining us today. So, Mr. Hadi, can you hear me right now? Yes, I do. Do you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you well. Uh, again, Mr. Hadi, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think uh, even though I have introduced you as our speaker, you can also introduce yourself in more detail. So, you know, our attendees can get you uh, can get to know you well. And yeah, uh, right now uh, I can I will make you the presenter. So you can also introduce yourself and start the presentation right away. All right. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right now you can, uh, you are the presenter and you can share your screen. All right, hello everyone. My name is Hadi Al Khatib. I'm a senior bridge engineer with Jacobs based in the New York office. Today I will be speaking to you about the California high speed rail project and specifically a concrete network type arch bridge uh, that has been designed for uh, construction package two and three. Let me get rid of this. Um, so if you see the setup and you've seen uh, my presentation a couple of months ago in the Western Bridge Engineer Seminars, I promise you it's the same setup, but I have a lot of new information provided in this uh, presentation. Okay, uh, an outline for my presentation today. I will go over the project status and the bridge location and the state, uh, state route 43. I will give a little bit more details about the superstructure and the substructure components of this bridge. I will go over the analysis methodology and the finite element models that we have uh, used for this bridge or that we have developed for this bridge in order to incorporate the analysis methodologies. I will touch base on some unique elements of this bridge, such as the hanger cables, the arch rib, and the erratic quick isolation bearing. And at the end, I will have uh, one quick slide about the construction status of this project. Of this, uh, of this bridge, sorry. Okay, so the California high-speed rail system is being built through a series of design-built contracts uh, in California uh, called, defined as construction packages. They have been, there have been uh, four construction packages so far. Construction package one, construction package two and three are uh, merged together and construction package four. So this bridge that I'm talking about, the network tight archer bridge is part of construction package two and three. Construction package two and three is the most significant uh, construction package out of the four packages. It includes 60 miles of rail and approximately 36 grade separations through the counties of Fresno, Tulare, and Kings. The contractor on this project is Ragados and Flatteron, and the Jacobs is the lead designer on construction package two and three. So the SR43 bridge, the network tight arch bridge, is located in Fresno County at State Route 43 between Davis Avenue and Cold Slough Bridge. So this is the State Route uh, 43, and the green line uh, represents the high-speed rail track. And this is a key map also showing the same information. Uh, so in construction package 2 and 3 has three different segments, segments 1, 2, and 3. So this uh, bridge is part of segment 1, and again, it is between Davis Avenue and Cold Slow Bridge. Uh, so the tight arch bridge, of course, it carries uh, high-speed trains over the route, uh, State Route 43. So the uh, bridge is 236 foot long. Uh, uh, underpass is a concrete network tight arch bridge. It's a single span bridge supporting ballasted tracks. There are two types of tracks, ballasted and direct fixation. So this one is supporting ballasted tracks. So the bridge consists of the following components, uh, post-tension concrete tie beams, uh, cast in place reinforced concrete arch trips and arch rib bracings, uh, reinforced concrete end diaphragms, pre-cast pre-stressed concrete floor beams, cast in place reinforced deck and longitudinal track diaphragms, and hanger cables in a network arrangement. 
this is a plan view and elevation of view of the bridge. The elevation of view shows that the bridge or the arch height is about 56 foot height. Again, it is a single span bridge, so it rests on two abutments, abutment one and abutment two. In the plan view, you can see the State Route 43 passes under the bridge and it is very close uh, or it is a close uh, to abutment two, but there is a future plan of widening the State Route 43. That's why Abutment one for now is a little bit far from uh, far from the right of way, but in the future, after they widen the bridge, it will be uh, similar. Also, maybe similar clearance to horizontal clearance to abutment to abutment two as well. This is a typical cross section of the bridge at the mid span. So the components of the bridge are uh, the tie beam is uh, eight feet deep, five feet wide. Uh, again, uh, post-tension concrete members. Uh, the arch ribs are six feet deep, five feet wide, uh, cast in place concrete. Uh, they are connected together with four arch bracings. They are four feet wide by four feet deep uh, arch uh, braces, as I mentioned. There are 20, 28 wide flange, 42 inch deep floor beams connecting the two tie beams together and supporting the slab deck and supporting, of course, the ballasted track. Uh, the hanger cables are a three inch diameter, a grade 150, high strength deformed threaded bars per ASTM A722. So if you've seen high speed rail uh, projects in, the, in, the, in, in California or for other bridges, let's say, it is a, a, a similar or a standard uh, guideway for uh, all bridges. Uh, so this is the uh, standard guideway for a ballasted track again. I listed all the components here from one through seven. So the waterproofing, the uh, circle uh, perforated corrugated galvanized uh, a drain pipe in the middle of the bridge because the bridge has actually cross slopes of two percent on both sides there is a cable trough uh, with the precast covers there are sound walls and there are trough walls with the trough walls there are also the ocs poles that they carry the catenary systems and there are of course the ballast the ties and the rails this is another uh, cross section of the bridge at the abutment. Uh, at the abutment, the tie beam depth increased to 10 feet at the knuckle area. So the knuckle area where the arch rib meets the tie beam. So this is triangular shape we call the knuckle, the knuckle area. Uh, there are two end diaphragms. There are uh, 13 feet wide by five feet deep, cast in place also reinforced concrete. The abutment, the abutment cab is eight feet deep, 36 uh, foot wide, uh, 60 foot long, uh, cast in place reinforced concrete, supported on a group of uh, four foot diameter shafts. There are uh, 15 uh, cast in place drill shafts uh, um, supporting the abutment and the abutment cab, and the abutment cab in its return supporting the stem, a 10 foot uh, thick stem uh, with a three foot uh, abutment uh, back wall and a two feet, uh, abutment, uh, two feet abutment wing wall. Uh, there are two erratic quick isolation bearings provided at every abutment and there are also two shear keys provided at every abutment. The hanger cables arrangement, there are 22 inclined hanger cables per arch plane. There are spaced at 16 foot. Uh, the hangers are anchored at the top of the arch rib and at the bottom of the tie beam. The hangers will be stressed in two stages during construction at the at the arch rib uh, anchorage. So the arch rib anchorage is the live end where we're gonna apply any retensioning or tensioning of the hangers from the arch rib level, and the 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 anchorage in the dead in the sorry in the tie beam will be actually a dead end. The, the bridge is also designed for hanger uh, cable loss and, ex and exchange per PTI recommendation, stay cable design, testing, and installation. The uh, framing plan uh, shows that we have 24 floor beams spaced at eight foot uh, and two floor beams spaced at six foot at each end will make a total number of floor beams uh, a total number of 28 floor beams supporting the deck and the ballasted track. And as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning and at the end of the bridge, there are two end diaphragms also connecting the tie beam together to provide more rigid to provide more rigid uh, frame frame action. Uh, the isolation bearings, there are four erratic quick isolation bearings provided by RJ Watson. So this is the hysteresis loop of the isolation bearing uh, used and the table below shows actually the uh, bearing characteristics of this uh, hysteresis loop. 
I'm going to point out just only maybe two uh, parameters about this. The QD value, which represents the friction force. The friction force actually it is it varies based on the limit state. So if you have if you have a static if you have a static load that is a low velocity, let's say, so that is a low friction. So we estimated the friction about 193.5 kip. And if you have a high velocity during an earthquake event such as strength five and extreme three limit states, then the uh, QD value will go to 387 kip, uh, kip. And then there is also a small uh, displacement that's going to happen with that. So uh, QD divided by that small displacement, it's about one eighth of an inch we estimated. That will give you the KU value, which is the elastic stiffness of this hysteresis loop. And the KD value also provided on this hysteresis loops comes from the stiffness of the springs that I will show you later on in my presentation. The analysis methodologies, uh, similar to any other uh, bridge uh, that was designed for high speed for California high speed rail as well. So we started with a static analysis. Uh, this is a general analysis, non-seismic analysis. And then we have developed the time-dependent construction stage analysis, uh, the nonlinear geometry analysis, including the pushover and the p-delta analysis, the hanger loss and hanger exchange analysis, uh, nonlinear seismic analysis with its uh, two components, the OBE and the MCE, uh, nonlinear track structure interaction includes four subcomponents: the frequency analysis, track serviceability, and rail structure interaction, and at the end, the dynamic analysis as well. So this table summarizes all the finite element models that we have and also shows the analysis and the, obje the analysis type and the objective of the model. So we're going to start with the static one, the non-seismic, the general one. So the analysis uh, type is linear static and live load analysis. The objective of this model is to capture the superstructure and substructure force demands. Usually the applicable limit states are uh, strength one to four, service one to three, and extreme one to two. Then we go to the construction stage analysis, uh, time-dependent analysis. The objective of this analysis is to capture the force deformation and uh, use the hanger force tuning to get the, uh, the pretension of the hangers. It is also applicable to the same limit states, strength one to four, service one to three, and extreme one to one and two. Uh, someone could, could uh, actually ask the question, why if, if both models are providing the same information for the same limit states, why do we need them? Why do we need to create two models? A simple answer for that is developing a construction stage model usually takes longer time than a, than a non-seismic model. This is a design build project. Uh, usually it takes a couple of uh, iterations between the designer and the contractor to agree on uh, a construction sequence for the bridge. So I would say usually we start with a non-seismic model. We get initial demands, initial forces demands, so we can size our members in an early stage and then if the contractor, we actually takes also a couple of, uh, couple of uh, I would say, dialogues with the contractor to get also all the, uh, till the contractor set their mind up about the uh, periods that they're going to build this structure and how long they're going to leave it because the construction stage analysis will consider all these factors in terms of the free band shrinkage and the, uh, the time-dependent uh, analysis, uh, the time-dependent uh, material in, of the, of that, uh, for that structure. Uh, another type of analysis is the hanger loss analysis. So that hanger loss analysis, it's, it's, it's two parts, the hanger loss and hanger exchange. So it, it has two parts, static and dynamic, again, per PTI recommendations. Uh, the seismic analysis has two levels, the OBE and the MCE, the maximum considered earthquake and the operating basis earthquake. Uh, so for both, uh, the, um, the, the, the objective of this analysis is to get the force demands from that seismic level. The OBE covers strength five and the MCE covered extreme three. Uh, the track structure interaction with its four components, uh, the first one is frequency. It's an eigenvalue analysis. What we get is usually a vertical and transverse torsional uh, frequencies, and we compare them with the recommendation from the project design criteria manual. Uh, so that will help uh, uh, give us a, a proportion uh, like structure and minimize the resonance effect if there is any. Uh, track serviceability, that is a live load and nonlinear time history analysis. And the objective of the analysis is to get the uh, superstructure and track deformations to make sure that the uh, ensure the passenger's comfort and make sure like there is no derailment with the, with the live load. Uh, the applicable limit state to that is group one to three. You're going to see some of these uh, limit states as, as not the 
the limit states that we usually are familiar with. So group one to three and group four to five, those limit states or those groups, uh, load groups are defined in the project design criteria. Some of them, they include uh, an OBE seismic level and include some dead load and live load based on the type of analysis that we are doing. The other type of track structure interaction is rail structure interaction. Uh, it is a nonlinear time history analysis and we do the analysis to get the rail deformation and the stresses. Um, the, uh, the last one is the dynamic analysis and it is also a nonlinear time history analysis and we do it to capture the vertical deck acceleration and get the dynamic amplification factor for the LLV train sets. And usually there are limits provided in the design criteria that we have to satisfy. So uh, a quick look at the finite element models that, or description of the finite element models that we have developed for the bridge. This is general description and it can fit most likely in all the, uh, all the finite element models that we have developed. Of course, we have used MIDAS, uh, civil, uh, detailed, 3D, uh, three-dimensional finite element models uh, developed in, in MIDAS to capture the geometry, the material, and the boundary nonlinearities. The finite element models of the SR43 tight arch bridge represents all the structural member, members of the bridge. There are four general elements that were used in, in our models. Uh, beam elements uh, we use for the piles, the tie beams, the arch rips, the arch rib braces, and the, the longitudinal track diaphragms. And we used plate chill elements for the footings, abutments, and the deck slab. We use tension-only truss cable elements for the hanger cables, and we use spring elements and general links for the PY curves and the bearings. The composite action between the pre-stress concrete and the floor beams, uh, sorry, between the pre-stress concrete floor beams and the deck was modeled through rigid links connecting the deck shell elements to the girder beam elements. Uh, there was also a fixed connection assumed between the floor beams and the tie beam uh, that was modeled through elastic rigid links. And there is also a fixed connection assumed between the arch rib and the arch rib bracings uh, using elastic rigid links as well. So that description fits very well that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the non-seismic model. And of course, it, it fits very well to the construction stage model, but it doesn't, uh, I mean, we'll have, of, of course, additional uh, elements that we have models, such as the, uh, the soil structure interaction and the nonlinear time history analysis. The construction stage analysis is performed using the finite element model to accurately capture the time dependent effects. So the first picture here is from our construction stage model that shows uh, after casting the tie beam and post tensioning it before we cast the end. Uh, diaphragms. Uh, the construction analysis accounts for various loadings and boundary conditions at different stages. Uh, Time-dependent properties, including the creep, shrinkage, and pre-stressing losses, are defined using the CEB FIB 1990 code. Uh, the second picture here is uh, when actually we casted the end diaphragms and casted the arch rib and the arch rib braces but still the bridge is carried on the false work before we uh, install the hangers and, and tension those hangers. Another useful uh, uh, tool that we use with the construction stage analysis is the MIDAS cable force tuning tool that was used to optimize the cable pretension of the hanger cables. So uh, the cable uh, force tuning calculates the effects of the cable pretension based on displacements or member forces or stresses through the influence matrix and update that results in a in a in, in a in a real time. So we have uh, done this. Uh, uh, Midas uh, manual uh, talks about cable state bridges, but we have used this for a network type arch bridge, and it was a very helpful tool. Uh, we 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 restrain the movement or or the deformation of the tie beams to about a quarter inch and. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're stressing the hangers in two stages, and uh, that's why we use this back and forth multiple times till we agreed on our hanger forces. Okay, so now we're done with the static analysis. You, as you noticed earlier, I used in, in the models that I used, I used maybe uh, short piles, or uh, I used the fixity of the piles at maybe 16 feet or so for, for four times the diameter uh, of, the, of the shafts. But uh, when it comes to the nonlinear time history analysis, we need to capture, of course, the, um, the soil structure interaction. So we used uh, PY curves to represent the lateral pile resistance, and we used TZ curves to represent the pile spin friction. 
we used QZ, uh, QZ curve uh, or spring to model the pile tip resistance. So we got the LPILE file from our geotechnical engineer, and then we discretized that LPILE file, or we got the PY curves along the shaft from that file based on, uh, based on uh, some intervals that we defined earlier. Um, the PY curves, uh, number of PY curves that you can get uh, from LPILE is limited to 50. So that's why we had to be, uh, we had to choose this, those intervals carefully to make sure that the, the intervals that we're giving, that we're getting out of the L pile, they're going to be well represented the soil structure interaction of the piles. But after we've done, this is a very time consuming uh, effort and it takes, uh, it takes time and a long time, a long time and effort to do it. But the problem once you are done with it and if you do not have a way to verify, that's going to be a, a little bit tough because uh, a small, uh, issue with that could lead to a big mistake in the analysis or, or a big difference in the in the results. So in order for us to eliminate that, we have uh, verified or come up with a, what we call a single pile verification for the soil structure interaction. So the purpose of this analysis is to determine if the springs developed to represent the soil stiffness in the finite element models are accurate. So after we we imported all the uh, the 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 PY curves into into the uh, into our model. We take the model, copy the model out, remove everything, just leave one single pile there, and we apply static and dynamic finite, uh, static and, and dynamic loads at the top of the pile, and then we compare the moment and displacement and shear forces uh, to the moment and displacement and shear forces that they come from L pile. Of course, if the results they match, uh, we consider this satisfactory. So this is something uh, that we have done many times to make sure that we are correctly capturing the effects of the soil structure interaction. Of course, also for the uh, nonlinear time history analysis, we need to model the bearings uh, correctly. So we used uh, the hysteristics bilinear isolator from Midas. This is also a direct, uh, a, a direct tool that you can use from Midas. Uh, the characteristics that I showed you earlier was uh, modeled here in, in this isolator and was reflected and the analysis was, was carried. Seismic analysis, um, the purpose of the seismic analysis is to determine the demands using nonlinear time history analysis. Uh, there are two levels of uh, seismic events that we're designing for. The maximum considered earthquake uh, that has a return period of 950 years. The goal is to safeguard against loss of life and major structural failures. And the OBE, the operating basis earthquake, has a return period of 50 years. And the goal is to prevent the interruption of high-speed train operations due to structural or track damage and derailment caused by OBE. There are seven ground motions and the average value of each response parameter used for the design. Uh, these are, the pictures here are showing representative the ground motions of the OBE and the MCE. Track structure interaction, again, there are four parts to that. Frequency analysis, the eigenvalue, it's, it's an eigenvalue analysis, and what we get at the end is a, is a frequency, and we compare it to the limits provided in the design criteria. The whole idea behind this is you want to minimize the resonance effects. Uh, track serviceability, it's a nonlinear time history analysis. Um, the, what we get from that is the deformation limits. There are some deformation limits provided in design criteria that we can compare. Uh, two in terms of deformation along the uh, along the bridge and in the transverse direction of the bridge. Uh, rail structure interaction, track serviceability actually has a, an OBE event as well, uh, similar to the rail structure interaction analysis. Uh, that is a nonlinear time history analysis. Uh, it is done usually for single or multiple tracks, and what we get from it is the deformation and the rail stresses. Um, so rail structure interaction and the track serviceability, they both has a, a seismic event involved with them with the live load as well. And that is the lower uh, seismic event, the, the, the lower than the MCE, the return period of 50, 50 years. The dynamic structural analysis is performed uh, on uh, five LLV train sets. And the speeds that we usually, uh, it varies between 90 and 250 mile per hour with an increment of 10 mile per hour per according to design criteria. And what we get from that is a dynamic impact factor, and we get also the vertical deck acceleration. 
So rail structure interaction, the purpose of this analysis is to limit the rail stresses and relative displacement at the expansion joints. Uh, continuous welded rails, uh, will, stresses will be carried over long distances because it's, it's welded rails. So the bilinear coupling spring, uh, springs representing the ballasted tracks with the concrete ties and the elastic fasteners are uh, given in the design criteria as I'm, I'm showing them over here with loaded and unloaded conditions. Um, with the loaded condition, it goes to about 1.35 kip uh, per inch. And the other one is about uh, the unloaded condition is uh, 2.7 or so. Uh, so this is a snapshot from our uh, rail structure interaction model, one of our rail structure interaction models. The purpose of the dynamic analysis is to check the deck acceleration for serviceability and calculate the load allowance, the impact factor, based on the LLV train sets. The vehicles were modeled as uh, time-dependent loads for varying speeds, uh, again, vary between 90 and 250 uh, miles per hour. The dynamic impact factor for shear and moment was determined uh, using the LLV train sets. Uh, for ballasted track, the Design criteria limit the vertical deck acceleration to 11.3 foot per second square. Uh, that's 0.35 G almost. And uh, the longitudinal track diaphragm that we provided on this bridge were actually provided to alleviate the vertical deck acceleration of the bridge. And at the end, we actually had to increase the size of these members a little bit to be able to control the vertical deck acceleration. Uh, hanger design criteria for replacement or, or loss. So the hanger replacement, um, for this bridge, uh, it provides, uh, again, the design of the, of the bridge provides uh, for the replacement of any individual hanger using the following load factors and combination. Again, those uh, for uh, hanger replacement and hanger loss, they are provided per the PTI recommendation for stake cable design and uh, testing and installation. So for the hanger replacement, it is 1.2 times the DC plus 1.4 DW plus 1.5 times the live load plus impact for plus the cable exchange force. The live load here, it is for one lane of Cooper E50 shifted away from the hanger under exchange. And for the hanger loss, uh, the load combination is 1.2 DC plus 1.35 DW, 0.75 times the live load plus impact plus 1.1 times the cable loss dynamic uh, forces. Uh, and the live load in the hangar uh, loss, it is actually for full live load, uh, two lanes, but it's reduced to 0.75. That's what the PTI recommendation. And the uh, cable loss dynamic force, it's, a, it's an impact. Uh, it is, according to our design criteria, it has an impact of 100%. So whatever static load that we have in that cable, if you have a sudden rupture in the hangar cable, you're going to apply double that load at the top of the arch and at the bottom of the tie beam and do your analysis. We have done also uh, a second order analysis uh, to determine the effects of the lateral drifts under uh, vertical loads. Uh, so the secondary moments acting on the arch rib are computed in uh, elastic second order analysis method. The moment magnification method uh, was investigated as well. Uh, it was shown actually, it's, it's shown as, as conservative, showed us like conservative results because it assumes lower column design resistance and produces larger second order effects. So we ended up using the elastic second order analysis uh, method. We have done also a pushover analysis to determine the buckling capacity of the arch trips. This capacity is then compared to the resistance of the reinforced concrete cross section computed in SP column. So the methodology is by applying a uniformly distributed load uh, on the bridge deck until the load deflection relationship in the arch trip becomes nonlinear. Uh, this is a picture uh, or the, the curve that we developed for the, uh, for the pushover analysis for the arch rib. And you can see that the uh, relationship here became nonlinear with a load factor of 90. So the analysis, the, this, the pushover analysis considers also the reduced flexural stiffness of the arch ribs according to ASHTO uh, and arch rib bracings as well. And the initial geometric imperfections in the arch rib and the, and the type. Uh, my favorite part of, uh, of this presentation is the erratic wick isolation bearing. So again, those are provided by RJ Watson. This picture is taken from RJ Watson website. The erratic wick isolation uh, is, a syst is a sliding system, um, uh, consists of steel, urethane, PTFE, and stainless steel material. It is very similar to the disc bearing. However, it is modified 
to be as an isolation bearing and slide uh, with, with these springs. So uh, we use erratic isolation bearings, and because we use them, we reduce the seismic forces on the substructure by a huge amount, uh, maybe two-thirds of the original force. However, that causes larger displacement uh, in, on our bridge, in the, in the, of course, in the longitudinal and transverse direction. So these two pictures are taken directly from our uh, structural uh, drawings. They show the uh, two elevations, the top, uh, the sole plate and the top bearing. Of course, they are connected directly to the tie beam and they are resting on the, uh, on the, on the, um, the guide bars of the isolator. And there are springs inside similar to those that they uh, push against the, uh, the guide bars. And of course, the sole plate, uh, sorry, the masonry plate is connected to the uh, pedestal through the anchor bolts. And these little pieces on the left and right, those are the fuse mechanism that I will talk about in a bit. So these two pictures, these two photos I just received actually from the manufacturer uh, two days ago. Uh, I'm excited to share them with you. Uh, the manufacturer is assembling now the bearing. Uh, they have used uh, seven uh, springs. Those seven springs provided uh, providing the 100 kip per inch, the KD value that we talked about. So this is for the hysteresis loop. Um, and uh, you can see here the, the shear pin, but this bearing is still uh, not completed. It still needs the other piece. So using a fuse mechanism, um, we after we had this uh, large displacement in the in the spe specifically in the transverse direction we had to come up with a solution because we reduced the force but we had a large displacement due to the use of isolation bearing so we came up with the idea of using a fuse mechanism so we designed those fuse mechanism to fail in shear and uh, not any other uh, failure mode uh, so the fuse mechanism uh, is designed again to fail to break at a certain level and uh, after it breaks, we're gonna take advantage of the use of the isolation bearing because we wanted our superstructure and substructure to satisfy capacity protected uh, components. So we didn't want to restrain the uh, component in the transverse direction and get a very large force or transfer a very large force to the substructure or the superstructure components because of this fuse mechanism. So we break it down at a certain level beyond the OBE where we do not need it after that to be, few, uh, we, where we do not need it to be after that standing. So we can take advantage of the use of isolation bearing, specifically in an, under an MCE event, a maximum considered earthquake. Uh, so again, the fuse mechanism designed to fail in shear. The fuse mechanism is actually uh, two plates connected at a 90 degree with some brackets inside, uh, some brackets supporting the, uh, the, vertical, uh, the vertical plate. Uh, the uh, fuse mechanism is uh, is next to uh, restrain stainless steel, so it can act still as an uh, as an expansion bearing in the in the longitudinal direction. Uh, so it can slide, and we have a one sixteenth of an inch gap between them. Uh, these uh, big holes they are for the anchor rods that they connect the masonry plate to the uh, or the bearing to the to the abutment. But these little holes they are for the threaded rods that we designed for the fuse mechanism. So this is the shear or this is the fuse mechanism. Uh, really, it, it it falls really or all the details is is in with is within this threaded rod. So this threaded rod is uh, is one and a half inch threaded rod. It was neck down uh, section at where we want it to fail uh, to 1.1 inches and uh, in order for us to prevent any bearing failure i mean uh, a bolt through a plate bearing failure we provided uh, a three uh, three eighth of uh, of an uh, like high strength steel uh, steel ring that embedded actually in the um, in the fuse mechanism to prevent uh, bearing uh, bearing failure through the bolt right through the plate so we wanted to ensure that this fail in shear, not anything else, not in a flexure or not anything else. So uh, I just received also uh, two days ago from the manufacturer uh, a very interesting video that they are already starting assembling this bearing and testing the, uh, the bearing. Hopefully this video will play. So in this one, they are testing the fuse mechanism. And uh, again, what we wanted from this fuse mechanism testing is we want this fuse mechanism to fail in a, in a, like a very, uh, sudden failure, which is a shear failure. That's why we designed the shear rod and we neck down the section of that shear rod to make it to make sure that it will fail in shear. So let me now play the video um, and hopefully you can see it without any lag at your at your end.
Okay, so I have played it uh, more than 20 times uh, before, but uh, I would uh, just uh, repeat it again and maybe stop before that it fails. Show you what I mean here by a small deformation. Oops, okay, this is what, what we wanted. So uh, I'm gonna play it again. Okay, so it keeps taking me to the next slide, but um, if you watch closely, you will see actually a small deformation in that uh, bracket. We still did not get the data from uh, from the manufacturer, but uh, if the data, what we get at the end is something called a force displacement curve, and we want to make sure that this force displacement curve is similar to the one that we assumed and we designed for. Uh, but if it is different, we have to play also a little bit or modify the design to make sure that it will fail the way it will fail the way that we wanted it to fail without an excessive deformation to prevent again any uh, 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 any deformation in the transverse direction during an OBE event if we're doing a, a rail structure interaction or or a, or a serviceability analysis because again we have very stringent requirements in the uh, for the deformation in the transverse direction and in fact the the limit is actually a quarter inch between uh, a quarter inch deformation on the track uh, on the rail uh, for rail structure interaction, and that's what was really controlling the design of this fuse mechanism. So, uh, a quick slide for the project uh, construction status. So, the SR43 network tight arch bridge is currently under construction. The construction of this substructure, including drill shafts, footings, and abutments, uh, has been completed. The erratic quick isolation bearings, as you saw, has been uh, are being fabricated, uh, and the procurement of the hanger cables, assemblies, and the post tensioning is under the way. Excuse me. The superstructure construction uh, expected to start early uh, this year, uh, following the erection of transverse floor beams, tie beams, and end diaphragms, uh, are cast on the false work, followed by casting the arch ships and the struts. All the false work will be removed following the initial stressing of the hangers. The second stressing of the hanger cables will take place following the casting, uh, following casting the deck and the track diaphragms. Casting the derailment walls, parapets uh, to be completed with this current design build contract. The rail system, the OCS poles, the sound walls, and the ballast system will be completed under a separate construction contract. So these are two construction photos for the uh, SR43 location from the SR43 location that shows the contractor is forming the abutments uh, for concrete and has uh, reinforcement uh, for that uh, stem. And they have, of course, completed the, um, the pile cap. With that, thank you very much for listening. Before I forget, let me uh, thank uh, my colleagues, whoever contributed on this work, uh, specifically my colleagues in the New York City office and my, our colleagues in the New Jersey office and our colleagues in the Tampa office who contributed also to the analysis of this bridge. And with that, thank you very much for listening and I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi, for the presentation that was really like insightful and also that was really great. So yeah, uh, everyone, right now we will do a QA and a session. So now I will give you guys a three minutes to put the questions on the questions bar on the control panel. So please type in the questions and then we will gather the questions and we will be discussing it after this. And before we move on to the questions, I will also ask you guys to fill out a quick poll. It's just like one question to help us improve, uh, you know, our service to you, our content to you and everything. So yeah, I am launching the poll right now and you guys can see it in a minute. So yeah, please kindly fill out the poll to let us know your experience with our content, our webinar, workshop, our article, and also our website content. So that way we can improve our service and we can also improve our content to help you guys with your needs and also your situation. Yep. Again, please fill out the quick poll so we can move on to the Q&A session after this.
Thank you. And don't forget to put the question on the question bar because we will collect it right now and we will be discussing it in a minute. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I will give you one more minute to put the question, and after this, we will be discussing it with Mr. Hadi. And for everyone who hasn't filled out the quick poll, please kindly fill out the quick poll so we can help you, we can improve our service and we can improve our content to serve you better. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much everyone for filling up the poll. I will close the poll right now. And yeah, Mr. Hadi, right now we have a lot of questions. Uh, I think we can start with the first slide of the question. So the question, the first question is from Srikota. What was the target factor of safety use in the design for the cable loss? Um, let me, I think it's, uh, I, I think the, the PTI recommendation is uh, 0.8 uh, of the ultimate uh, ultimate strength and and that's about 125 ksi not exactly sure about the 0.8 it is either 0 0.8 0 0.85 something like that okay thank you so much the second question from by quinta silwell does seismic obe is equivalent to the dpe or different case if different case why say uh, seismic dpe case is not considered for the analysis Mm, I'm not sure what is the DB, DBE is um, the seismic equivalent to DBE. Okay. Yeah, I think the, we can move on to the, to yeah. the next question. Yeah, we sure. can uh, keep this question uh, for later. I will email you for that. The third question is from uh, Kate Russell. I was wondering why your team decided to use a pre-stress pre concrete type girder over a steel box section, given that it carries primarily tension. Yes, so uh, this was uh, decided by the authority. They prefer concrete, and that's why they prefer the concrete uh, network tight arch. It wasn't our call in, in that uh, a bit. So we helped them at some point, but it was their call. Okay, thank you so much. Next question from Baikunta. How do how do you use buckling analysis result for the arch analysis? So the uh, buckling analysis results that we got from the uh, from the pushover analysis. Uh, was compared to the SB column capacities uh, of the of the arch rib itself. So that's how we make sure that the buckling load is less than the capacity of the of the uh, of the arch rib. Okay, thank you. Next question from Tarek uh, Tarek Hosini. Uh, when you check the response of the piles based on the PY curve defined in my 3D model for its validation, knowing that uh, the LPL is a 1D model, how did you validate the MIDAS model? Did you get the same values for the deflection at the top of the piles obtained in LPILE? One second, please. Okay, well, um, no, because uh, what we assumed is, is just a, a dummy load in the in the L pile and of course in the in the single pile verifications, just to make sure that it was it was done appropriately, but uh, we have done it on many different loads. Like uh, when we did our analysis, we got the maximum load, the maximum the, the, from the maximum considered earthquake from OBE from strength one to four. So we applied these loads in L pile, and then we applied the same loads in uh, static loads and dynamic loads in uh, in uh, in Midas, and then we did a couple of comparisons. So what I showed you is is just one example, but we have done 
that uh, multiple times and, and we have shown a good agreement between the two. Okay, I see. Next question from also Tariq. In the nonlinear dynamic analysis, seismic and TSI, did you consider one value of the damping, the one of the pre-stress or reinforced concrete, or did you consider different dampings, the one of pre-stress concrete still for cables and reinforced concrete in the same model? We considered the uh, really damping in the nonlinear time history analysis and the anchoring frequency that we have used, it is uh, pretty well defined in our design criteria uh, about those anchoring frequency. So we use really damping with the anchoring frequency defined in the design criteria. So the, the upper bun uh, is with a 90% 90, uh, 90 mass participation factor and the lower one, uh, I forget what exactly the, the specific criteria about it. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi. Next question from Srikota. Did the push offer analysis add any value given that isolation bearings were used and fuse mechanism was used for versus beyond OBE level EQ? Yes, uh, I mean we had to do it. Uh, we had to do a pushover analysis because the uh, during or while we have this uh, isolation bearing, as I mentioned earlier, we have this fuse mechanism stands in place. So the bearing in the transverse direction, it is not really an isolation bearing till this diffuse mechanism fails. And this diffuse mechanism fails in a later stage, like after the OBE level, before the MCE level. So yes, we had to do a pushover analysis in order for us to, to determine that. Okay, thank you. Also from Srikota, has the project criteria required to use a higher factor of safety than PTI recommendation for cable loss or replacement design? No. Okay. Next question from Siddharth Patil. Can you please share details about the connection between tie beams and arch rib? Yes, so the uh, detail is uh, is actually in the uh, in the knuckle. That's that's what we call the knuckle area. And uh, it is pretty heavy reinforced uh, area. Uh, it was usually, it's, it's usually analyzed with uh, maybe strutton tie model to, to capture all the tension and compression that comes, tension that comes from the tie beam at the bottom and the compression that comes from the arch rib. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely whoever asked the question, feel free to uh, maybe email me or once the structural plans are out for public, uh, of course, uh, they, they can check the details there, yes. Okay, thank you so much. And also FYI for all the attendees, if you guys have any questions or you know you want to discuss with Mr. Hadi, please email our email at grow at .com and we can help you connect with Mr. Hadi to discuss the question. Uh, next question from Nicola. So what is the main reason the client chose a tight arch bridge in the case of this bridge? I think it's a good question for the client, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, the uh, California in general, they, they like concrete structures and, and maybe that's what they, they prefer, but it's a very good question for the client. But uh, they wanted, I guess, a, a signature structure with the, with the high speed. Uh, so that's what I believe the answer, but yeah, it's, uh, I would say refer to back to the client, yes. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. And let's move on to the second slide. I'm just going to uh, refresh the slide. And wait a minute. Yep, I'm just going to fix the question. Yep, I'm just going to read it. It's fine. Okay, for the second slide, from Sung Lee, how to make sure to engage all buildings up to failure mechanism simultaneously? I'm um, sorry, what question are you at? The first question, how, oh, to make sure, okay. how, how to make sure to engage all buildings up to failure mechanism simultaneously? Well, uh, so in the in the longitudinal direction, there is no problem because the uh, erratic quick isolation bearings, they, they are fully set to act as an isolation bearing. In the transverse direction, um, whenever we, we have got like all the ground motions and uh, 27 ground motions and, and we have applied all of them and we take, they take the average of them. So the I would say all the isolation bearings, maybe they might get a little bit like engaged at different times, but the fuse mechanism will get engaged in, an, in, a, in a very early state because the gap there is just only one sixteenth of an inch. And before we actually install the, uh, the fuse mechanism, we noticed uh, a deformation there about like uh, about inch and a half in the transverse direction. So one sixteenth of an inch comparing to inch and a half is going to be like a very small, or the maximum was inch and a half. So it's going to be very small value. So 
the uh, bearings, the diffuse mechanism in the transverse direction will get very in, engaged in a very early stage of an of an uh, a seismic event. Okay, thank you. And next question from Jump Shade Sawab: How did you determine the length of fixity of the drilled shaft? Mm -hmm. So the fixity of the drill shafts, um, we usually look at the at the L pile um, multiple times and do a couple of iterations to make sure this is the the correct fixity. But it's usually, I mean, what we notice in this project is about three to four times the 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 the, the shaft the shaft diameter. So. Okay. Uh, next question. So Kuhiar Faizi was wondering to ask the train moving load simulations do in the, uh, in in the train moving load simulations do we need to consider the dynamic load factor i'm sorry wait a minute a uh, factor to account for the impact evac of wheel which is influenced by the train speed equivalent dynamic axle load yes uh, that is uh, part of the of the dynamic analysis that i mentioned so the, the part of the track structure interaction the dynamic analysis so we do that specific analysis to to get the uh, the uh, the um, the, uh, the what is it the uh, sorry the impact factor uh, due to the high speed train so we run the trains with different speeds uh, again as i mentioned from 90 to 250 mile per hour based on a 10 mile per hour increments and then we get uh, we get the uh, the impact factor based on moment and shear and displacement and then we use that back in our analysis with our uh, actual trains the llb set only Okay, thank you so much. Next question from Upul Atanayake. How did you verify if the CEB FIP model is suitable for the concrete mix that you use for the bridge components? So uh, that is, uh, this information actually provided to us in the project design criteria manual and we're forced to use it. Okay, next question. Knowing your background and PhD are in H, uh, H, uh, sorry, SHM and BHM, what aspect do you use as critical to monitor with these advanced technologies? How have you come about understanding this from Mary Katsuk? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, so I have a background in structural health monitoring and bridge health monitoring, and uh, I know that uh, now uh, many bridges outside of this country is almost uh, maybe every signature bridge uh, that has uh, these uh, structural health like these systems shm and, and bridge health monitoring so i hope there will be a decision made by the authority at some point to use uh, such uh, systems that will help actually advance the uh, advance the the uh, the i would say the maintenance and the uh, durability of these structures with time and of course prevent any uh, loss that might happen due to an uh, extreme event such as an earthquake or any other event Okay, thank you so much. Next question from Baikunta. What types of buckling analysis is used for this bridge? Type of buckling analysis. Um, not sure what he means by the type of buckling analysis. Uh, okay, I think we can skip this question for now and we can uh, move on to the next question. It's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, next question from Rowan. Out of curiosity, did you consider a steel arch? I think it's yeah okay yep okay next question from Tarek the isolation bearings contains a lead that yields under cyclic forces uh, to allow the energy dis dissipation and therefore reduce the acceleration values in the structure did you consider this reduction of the acceleration values and if it's the case what was the reduction value considered So the reduction in uh, force, as I mentioned, uh, so before we actually adapt the isolation bearing used for this bridge, we were actually planning to use the uh, transmission shock devices on this bridge and uh, two transmission shock devices at one abutment and make the load share between all the four bearings. Uh, however, for some reason, this transmission shock device did not work uh, because of some clearance issues. So we had to switch to another seismic dissipation energy method, which was the isolation bearing. So be uh, comparing the situation with a with a with a, a, a transmission shock device and an isolation bearing. The force uh, has actually decreased by maybe uh, two thirds of the of the actual force. Okay, thank you so much. Next question from Chris: Can you talk about some of the critical elements in the structure that saw the largest dynamic amplification? It's a good question. It was uh, mainly the tie beam and the arch knuckle. Uh, they were uh, the, the largest uh, 
I would say the two main elements that uh, experience that uh, the dynamic amplification factor. The tie beam mainly is the one what's exactly controlling. Tito, do you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. So yeah, thank you so much. And next question is from Shaima. How long do we need to be an expert in modeling using MyDCPL? I think you can answer it based on your experience. Well, I mean, uh, MyDOS is a very useful software. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to learn it and uh, get to know it. So you can do multiple different things with it. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Hadi. Everyone, if you want to learn about MyDOS software, if you want to use it, don't worry about it. We have like a really amazing technical team that can help you with all the uh, issues, obstacles, and everything, especially in terms of learning, because we have a lot of like, you know, trainings. So yeah, please let us know if you know want to learn uh, about anything or like, you know, want to like have a training, we can help you with that. Next question is from uh, Upul. Is the concrete mix primarily include type one cement or are there any supplementary cementious materials in it? If so, was there are study to look at trip and shrinkage properties? How do you correlate that to field conditions? That's a, a very good question. Uh, so usually in, 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 in bridges, maybe they, they do that, but the uh, in this bridge specifically, the mix, uh, the concrete mix, um, because Jacobs is doing many bridges on this construction package two and three, is actually uh, given or uh, let's say presented or, or proposed from the contractor, uh, subcontractor uh, plan to the actually, and comes to the engineers of Jacobs to for check and uh, QC and approval. Uh, but uh, there was no, a plan of going back to the uh, construction stage model and updating uh, the uh, creep and shrinkage uh, properties. Uh, at some point, we talked about it. We wanted to do it at some point, but it wouldn't maybe make a big difference in the uh, in the construction stage analysis uh, because mainly the what's controlling our design is the uh, is the seismic events and uh, those uh, seismic events, you know, they are beyond the construction stage analysis. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hari. Next question. What plan of action will you consider if the isolation bearing doesn't fail the way or the values do not fall within the calculation you predicted? Oh, very good question. Very good question. Uh, so we are forcing it to fail in, in that direction. And that's why we are testing the fuse mechanism and we are testing that threaded rod uh, to fail and make sure that it will fail in shear at a certain level. So we're gonna do everything possible to make sure that it fails, but in case this doesn't fail and it goes to the MCE level, still we have some uh, reserve capacity in the superstructure and the substructure to take up to the, uh, the MCE event, the maximum considered earthquake event loads. Beyond that, it's not our responsibility because uh, that's what design criteria tells us to do, you know, at the MCE level. But if that also increased, then the bearing itself might fail. And what we have provided also is the uh, shear blocks to resist uh, or prevent any collapse of the structure under uh, on the SR43 route. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi. So first of all, uh, Mr. Hadi, I want to ask you, do you still have like maybe like five minutes to answer the rest of the questions? If you don't, uh, I can just like, you know, email you the questions and you can like answer it when you have free time. No, sure, let's uh, let's go for it. Okay, uh, next question, uh, what types of, oh, I think uh, we have answered this. Uh, the next question is, since it was a complicated model with interaction between components, how did you validate the model to make sure it is working properly? From Cyrus Hamed Hosseinpur. Uh, what question is this? Uh, the second question. Since okay. it was, yeah, since it was a complicated model, how did you validate the model to make sure it is working properly? Uh, that's a good question. So the, in general, the, uh, um, the, um, all the projects that are designed with the California high speed rail, they are being checked also by not the models that we designed, but also there is an independent checking engineer on the other hand at the, at the authority side. That's also, they have done their own uh, model and they, they develop uh, these models and they come up with all these uh, designs and they check, check kind of uh, our designs independently. So this is a, a one way of, of verification. And of course, every model that we do in, in Jacobs that been actually uh, within the, the QC process within, uh, within Jacobs. Okay, thank you so much. Next question, how was the analysis or design independently checked? How close were the independent checkers and EORs results? Yeah, I mean, there were some disagreement with the independent uh, checker engineer, but uh, 
it's a very complex analysis uh, very various different models uh, so you can expect some differences between uh, two separate engineers but at the end we came to an agreement and the uh, the bridge is uh, under construction and we received the uh, the approval on on the on the plans okay thank you next question what was the main reason that led to use the re reinforced concrete material for the arch instead of steel was it governed by the dynamic no so Tarek, this is uh, not our call. This is again uh, was the uh, the authority call, and I'm not sure uh, this is a question, a very good question for the authority. Okay. Next question: What protocols or guidelines did you use to do redundancy analysis? Uh, we did not do uh, a separate redundancy analysis, but uh, our analysis, like for example, for the hanger cables, it was. We know that it is a redundant analysis because if you have uh, lost a camber, uh, sorry, if you have lost a, a hanger, if you had a, a sudden rupture, uh, you know, still the other hangers can still carry the load. And also if you are replacing a hanger uh, during a live load being on the other track, that is still the bridge is safe and uh, fine and it can carry the live load. So that's the only redundant analysis that we have done. Okay, thank you so much. Next question. What is the reason that the threaded rod was used as the hanger instead of multi-strand multi cable or structural strand? Uh, I think uh, originally we investigated both options and the hanger cable were picked over the cable because it is, uh, I think it's more cost effective and more appropriate for this project. But this is not the full answer for it. There is more behind it, but I don't have it on top of my head now. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi. Next question. What is the difference of 3D model with and without considering the soil interaction from William Moore? Yeah, so the soil structure interaction, it's complex. It, it takes time to develop this, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, usually you do not need it or it wouldn't make much difference in a a general uh, non-seismic analysis like static analysis and it wouldn't make also a difference maybe a big difference in the um, in the construction stage analysis and those are the main two analyses that you first need to start like building or sizing your members of the, of the bridge so we start developing or in, uh, getting involved the soil structure interaction involved when we need definitely a non-linear time history analysis for the bridge not before that okay thank you so much next question also from william did the max displacement did the max displacement under MCE exceed the bearing width and fall down? Um, not sure if I fully understand the question, but uh, the maximum uh, the maximum displacement under the MCE it's different in the longitudinal direction and transverse direction, and the longitudinal direction was about two inches or so. But usually, uh, the interesting thing is that these erratic quick bearings are designed for uh, a 50 percent reserve capacity in displacement so let's assume that you give the manufacturer and you tell them they need an isolation bearing that can handle up to two inches so they multiply that two inches by 1.5 and that's the value that they designed for so it's they design a value they design a bearing for three inches so so no it, it was just in the matter of in the in the, in the numbers of, of inches so it did not increase or uh, exceed the width or the bearing width Okay, thank you. Next question. What are the details at cable connections? So uh, we have provided uh, some details based on uh, one manufacturer, uh, Dewey DAG, but uh, still uh, the contractor, uh, they did not pick the, uh, the uh, PT supplier for this project. So the details, they might change, uh, but uh, we have provided the full details. Um, and I'm not sure what kind of details you're asking about here. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi. Next question from Gregory. Were there analysis conducted for choosing between a vertical hangers versus inclined or network hangers? Yeah, it's a very good question. Yes, we have done uh, analysis uh, in an early stage of the project. So uh, uh, like using a vertical hang hangers versus uh, a network hangers. And we found that we found out that using a, a network hangers will actually reduce the size of the tie beam and will be more effective uh, in this bridge. And uh, that analysis we have documented and we have done long time ago. And that's why we ended up using uh, network uh, hangers instead of a vertical hangers. Okay, last question that we have today from Aihan Akai. Have the wind loads had any significant effects on bearings or cables? 
Uh, no significant effects from wind loads, but they have been, uh, of course, considered in all types of analysis. They have been also considered during construction and uh, after and, and post-construction. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, main uh, criteria that controls the really, uh, like our bridges, is really the seismic events and the track structure interaction uh, analysis. And uh, yes, so they were considered, but no significant effects. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi, for answering the questions. I think this is the first time we have almost 40 questions in one session. And I think all the attendees agree that this session is really, really like insightful. Thank you so much for that. So yeah, I think uh, this is the end of our session. Mr. Hadi, do you want to say anything? Do you want to say something before we close the session? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And I uh, enjoyed answering the question and presenting to uh, this audience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hadi. It's our pleasure and we appreciate your help in sharing your knowledge and experience. Also from all the attendees, don't forget to check our blog on our website to access more webinars, workshop, and a lot of like engineering articles. And also if you want to be connected with Mr. Hadi, don't forget to email, at, email us at grow at .com and we will connect you with, uh, with Mr. Hadi. And yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Hadi. And thank you so much everyone who joining the session today. Uh, hopefully it, this will be like insightful for all of you. And yeah, see you at the next session and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.